Hello and welcome. My name is Hattie Bryant and I'm the author of I'll Have It My Way. The purpose of this video is to walk you through the completion of the workbook at the back of the book on pages 184 to 211. I designed the book to be used, not just read. I hope you do both, read it and use it. Let me assume now that you've done some reading, so let's get started. And if you don't understand any part of this, I invite you to go back and read. The reason I took the time, nearly five years, to write the book is that I personally didn't understand why advanced care planning is necessary. Now that I know what I know, I assure you we all need to do this kind of thinking for ourselves. We'll begin on page 184 and you'll see here that an attorney is pointing out that you do not need to go to an attorney to create legal documents. However, if you have a lot of assets or people in your life who would argue about your health care or your possessions, you can take what you've done here in the workbook to an attorney and have that person codify it for you. Although, I have a better idea that won't cost you any money. What you're going to write here is not like a will. A will is often kept under lock and key and only read by the executor after your death. It, that makes sense. You might not want people to know in advance what you're going to do with your things and who's going to get what. Here, we're not talking about things. We're talking about you. We're talking about your mind, body, and soul. We're talking about your personhood, your life, the way you live your life, all the way to the end. So, with what you write here, I want you to tell everyone, and tell everyone soon. Every American over 18 needs to fill in this workbook and share what they wrote with family, friends, physicians, and neighbors. Let's read together what I have here on page 185. User warning. If you apply what you have learned here, you will be ready to die when the time comes. If you've named your proxy on page 211, and if you've shared what you've written with every key player in your life, you can breathe easy. If not, every person in your life who will have their own baggage could guilt you into taking treatments you don't want or be more needy as you age and get sick. Please invite your family and friends to handle unfinished business as it comes. Don't let it collect. Don't let anyone sabotage your exquisite exit by making you carry their bags. This very thing is happening every day in every hospital. And the result of this is seen in nursing homes and other elder care facilities. There's a two-part problem, and you can solve both problems by using this workbook. First, you can be the problem because you won't think about these things. And second, family can be the problem if you didn't provide instructions. They're left to figure out what you want, so they give you everything. So let's solve both problems now. At the top of page 186, you see, need to know, number one, everyone dies. The mortality rate is 1,000%, and we can't deny this fact. So go ahead and fill in the blanks on the top of page 186 and check just one of the boxes rating your current health. Please pause the video while you write. At the top of page 187, it says, need to do number one. Face the inevitability of death and any fears you have about it, and I say there might be three good reasons to deny the reality of death. One, you deny truth because you have what's called unfinished business. Fritz Perls would say you have things to say to some of the people in your life. So let's answer these questions. If you died soon, would a person you have been or are currently angry with know that you let it go and you're no longer angry? Yes, no. If you died soon, would someone you know you've hurt know that you're sorry? Yes, no. If you died soon, would the people who are so helpful to you in your life have heard you say to them recently, thank you. Thank you for keeping dinner for me. Thank you for raking the leaves. Thank you for cleaning out the dishwasher. Yes, 
No. If you died soon, would the people you love know that you love them? Have you told them you love them in the last few days or weeks? Yes, no. You see, many people hold on to their heartbeat in order to complete unfinished business. The time to complete all unfinished business is daily. This way, when your body does want to quit, your spirit can make an easy transition out as you will have zero emotional barriers. You will have no unfinished business. Think of going to sleep every night as your rehearsal for death, because it is, you know. Settle emotional problems and you'll sleep like a baby. Now, on page 188, you'll make a list of people you need to talk with right away. These are people you love, people you want to say I'm sorry to, people you want to thank for everything they've done for you, people who occupy both sweet and sour spots in your heart. You want the sour spots to turn sweet and the sweet spots to get sweeter. Even better than talking to people on this list is write love letters, write thank you notes, and even a few I'm so sorry notes. Even if you're in perfect health right now, I want you to imagine while you do the work here that you have been given a difficult diagnosis. What if you only have a, a year or a few months to live? Take time soon to write notes and letters. You can use email, of course, but I suggest you use paper and pen to write these love letters, thank you notes, or I'm sorry notes. To help you do this, you can see my sample love letters on page 123 and 124. Don't worry about people who might be hard to talk to or communicate with. On the top of page 189, I give you a method to heal yourself without confronting anyone who could hurt you with their response. Please pause the video while you make a list of the people you need to talk with or write to. Let's go on to a second reason you may stay in denial that your life here will end someday. On page 189, you can read, you may deny that you're going to die because people depend upon you and you have bills to pay. The obligations keep you on a fast track and you simply don't have time to die. You can write now while I'm talking as this is a pretty obvious list and this section might not even apply to you. It doesn't apply to me, for example, because everyone in my life is either perfectly fine and taking care of themselves or they have good parents who are taking care of them. So, make a list of people who depend on you. This would include children under 18 or anyone physically or mentally disabled and unable to care for themselves. Parents, a spouse, employees who directly work for you, students in a class you teach. You can skip this section if it does not apply to you. When you look at that list, let's think together. Do you worry that some of these people will fall apart without you? Yes, no. If you died soon, would you leave financial burdens behind? Yes, no. What steps can you take to be at peace over these concerns? If you like, stop the video and write some things you can do to address those concerns. Next is probably the biggest reason none of us want to die, really. We have things we want to do. This is where working in this book gets fun. On page 190, get busy and make your list. Do you remember the nurse who learned from her patient that she needed to go to Paris right away? Well, let's turn to page 127 in your book. At the bottom it says, Deb, a palliative care nurse, was with a patient who was dying. He said, the only regret he had was that he had not gone to Paris. Deb, who has a very big job in a big hospital, went home and asked her husband if he could arrange to take off work right away. A few weeks later, the two were in Paris because Deb, too, had always wanted to go to Paris. Her dying patient taught her how to live her life. All right, so you may deny that you're going to die because you've got places to go and people to see. 
So these are your dreams. So go ahead now and plan to take action on the dreams. Please pause the video to write. When you finish this page, you are one fourth of the way done already. You may even need a tablet of paper if I didn't give you enough space here. On the top of page 192, you see you have to learn that medicine has limits. Even the fantastic and sophisticated medicine we have available is way too small up against the force of nature. On the top of page 193, it says you need to think for yourself and make some hard choices. Remember, I would like you to imagine right now that you've been given a difficult diagnosis and the people you love need to know how you feel about the way you want your life to unfold all the way to the end, okay? I'll read out the statements and I want you to mark true or false for yourself. And don't worry what others think. What matters is what you believe is true for you. Also, keep in mind, I would like you to imagine that you have been given a difficult diagnosis. I am afraid to die. True, false. I am afraid of the dying process. True, false. I am afraid my family will fall apart if I'm not here to hold everyone together. True, false. I am afraid my spouse will not be able to live without me. True, false. I am afraid I will be dependent on others in the last few years of my life. True, false. In case of trauma, such as car accident or severe life-threatening medical events, such as a stroke or heart attack, I am okay with intubation for a few days if I can walk out of the hospital in the condition I was in or if there is high certainty that I can return to the condition I was in before the trauma. True, false. I want an incision or a cut in my stomach to attach a feeding tube if I can't swallow. True, false. I want an incision or cut in my throat to attach a breathing machine if I can't breathe on my own. True, false. I understand that it is legal for me to refuse medical treatment. True, false. Okay, let's keep going. You can see that the American Bar Association gave me permission to publish here their very useful exercise. Again, I'll read these statements and you mark your choice. Please use your imagination and place yourself squarely into the situation described. There are five choices for each situation. Choice one is you definitely want curative care. Two, you probably would want curative care that might keep you alive. Three, you're unsure of what you want. Four, probably would want only care to keep you comfortable. Five, definitely want only care to keep you comfortable. All right, keeping those five responses in mind, remember, what if you can no longer recognize or interact with family or friends? Choose one, two, three, four, or five. What if you can no longer talk clearly? Choose one, two, three, four, five. You can no longer respond to commands or requests. Choose one, two, three, four, or five. You can no longer walk, but you get around in a wheelchair. One, two, three, four, five. You're in severe pain most of the time. One, two, three, four, five. You are in severe discomfort, such as nausea, diarrhea, most of the time. One, two, three, four, five. You're on a feeding tube to keep you alive. One, two, three, four, five. 
You're on kidney dialysis machine to keep you alive. One, two, three, four, five. You're on a breathing machine to keep you alive. One, two, three, four, five. You need someone to care for you 24 hours a day. One, two, three, four, five. No longer can control your bladder. One, two, three, four, five. No longer can control your bowels. One, two, three, four, five. You're living in a nursing home permanently. One, two, three, four, five. Now, read the following questions and check the box that best reflects your response. What would you tell your doctor to do if you had a disease that is incurable and you will become dependent on others for your care? And make a choice, choose stop curative treatment and provide comfort care or palliative care to allow natural death, or continue with aggressive treatments. Second question, what would you tell your doctor to do if you have a disease with no hope of improvement and are suffering with severe pain? Would you say stop curative treatment and provide comfort care or palliative care to allow natural death, or proceed with aggressive treatments? Okay, we're halfway through the workbook now. On page 197 it says, you need to know that doctors do not expect as much from medicine as the rest of us do. They know that medicine cannot give us what we need for peace at the end of our lives. They know that our leaving is as much emotional and spiritual as it is physical. They see death so often, as one said, for doctors, Death is just another day at the office. They see the limits of medicine every day, and they know that dying doesn't cause suffering. Resistance to dying causes suffering. On page 198 is our third need to do, and that is you have to think and decide for yourself if you want to allow nature to take its course. And it's perfectly fine if you don't. It's your choice. That's why I call this book, I'll Have It My Way. So let's take ourselves through this exercise that was used to find out what physicians think and feel about life-sustaining treatments. Use your imagination, okay? If you had brain damage that can't be reversed and you're not able to recognize people or speak understandably, but you have no terminal illness, indicate what you would want regarding the use of each of these procedures. Remember, this is the situation my mom was in. She didn't know us, she couldn't communicate, but her heart and lungs were strong. She could have been kept alive by modern medicine, but we didn't agree with the definition of life that modern medicine was using. To us, she was not alive. How can this be life? To us, there was nothing about lying in a bed with a feeding tube that could be life. So for this exercise, remember, you don't recognize people, you can't communicate, and your condition worsens, which could require doctors to do one of the following. All right? Would you want cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR? Choose yes, no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Mechanical ventilation, yes, no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Intravenous hydration, yes, no, Undecided, I'll take a trial. Feeding tube, yes, no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Major surgery, yes, no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Dialysis, yes, no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Chemotherapy for cancer, yes, no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Invasive diagnostic testing, such as endoscopy. Yes, no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Blood or blood products. Yes, no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Antibiotics. Yes, 
no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Pain medications, even if they dull consciousness and indirectly shorten my life, yes, no, undecided, I'll take a trial. Now, specifically regarding CPR, how do you feel about its use versus allowing natural death? Remember that the older we get, the greater the chance that CPR can lead to complications that can mean we're technically alive, but only by machine. Knowing that, if my heart stops, I want you to check one. I want CPR, I do not want CPR, go ahead and allow natural death or I will have CPR if and only if the doctor thinks I will be as good as I was before my heart stopped. If your health ever deteriorates due to serious illness and your doctors believe you will not be able to interact meaningfully with your family, friends, or surroundings, I want you to check which of the following statements that best describes what you'd like to tell them. I prefer that they stop all life-sustaining treatments and allow natural death to come as gently as possible or I would like them to keep trying life-sustaining treatments. And what about palliative care? Choose yes or no. If you are in great pain as you become more ill or frail, would you want your doctors to bring in a palliative care team which provides pain management, symptom management, plus emotional and spiritual support for you and your family and helps promote quality of life? Yes or no? If the following will not bring me back to the life I had before I arrived at a hospital, one, do you want to be attached to a mechanical breathing machine? Yes, no. Do you want antibiotics? Yes, no. Do you want hydration with intravenous lines? Yes, no. Do you want tubes or intravenous feeding if you can't eat on your own? Yes, no. Okay, let's together just keep at this. We're coming to the end of the work and to the most important section. You must grasp what you see on page 202. The need to know number four, your doctor does not make end of life decisions for you, you do. Three out of four of us will not be able to speak for ourselves as we become very frail or seriously ill. This means you must do number four. You can read on page 203 what Dr. De La Pena warns about for all of us. He is a geriatrician who spent his career caring for seniors. He is just one of the physicians who helped me write this book, and all of them agree you must choose a person who will speak to doctors for you when and if the time comes when you will not be able to do this for yourself. Just before you choose your proxy or healthcare decision maker or surrogate or durable power of attorney for healthcare, those all mean the same thing, let's get even more specific with your instructions. I want you to think about money now because if you have a lot or nearly none, this is very important. We're moving now to page 205. You need to decide how much your own health care costs should impact the healthy friends and family in your circle of care. These are your thoughts, not what you believe other people would expect you to answer. Based on what I know now, my health care costs today are minimal, true, false. My only health care expenses are for insurance premiums and occasional doctor visits. True, false. I have noticed my health insurance premiums rising as I age. True, false. I am guessing my health insurance premiums will continue to rise. True, false. I am ready for the cost to increase. True, false. I avoid going to the doctor because I can't afford it. True, false. I am willing to spend my savings on my health care, even if it means I have nothing left to leave my children. True, false. I am willing to leave my children with unpaid medical bills. True, false. Money is not an issue to me if I can add weeks, months, or years to my life. True, false. I am willing to spend my savings on my health care. True, false. I am willing to be sick from treatments if it means I can live another year or two. True, false. I am willing to live a medicalized life, and this means I'm dependent on drugs, devices, and monitoring by doctors. 
true false. I am willing to ask my friends and family to support me in my decision to pursue all treatment options that will require their time and energy. True false. It would be easy for me to live in my house even if I was in a wheelchair. True false. Now, please turn to page 206. These four statements are going to be hard to read, I know, but they are here to force you to confront the reality ahead of you. Let's read them together, then after you have read all four, check the one that fits you best. First, it's okay with me if keeping me alive requires unlimited resources, paid for insurance, private Medicare or Medicaid, my own savings, the savings of family, and makes heavy demands on the time, emotions, and family and friends. Second statement, it's okay with me if keeping me alive requires unlimited resources paid for by insurance, private, Medicare, or Medicaid, and my own savings. However, I do not want my care to be a financial or emotional burden on my family. So when my money runs out, let me go naturally. I realize that this choice means I might have nothing left to leave my children and grandchildren. Next, it's okay to keep me alive so long as it's paid for by insurance, private, Medicaid, and Medicare. So when my benefits run out, let me go naturally. That way I can leave any assets to my family. Or I'm beginning to understand that keeping me alive at all costs, money, and the efforts required of so many others is not what I want for my life. I want to leave gently with people sorry to see me go rather than hoping I will go. So I want you to choose one of those four statements. Your answer will bring you great sense of relief and provide your family with excellent direction. Now let's look at page 207 and let's rest on that page. Doctors are now researching and writing about how modern medicine can keep a heart beating, but for what? Doctors and their teams can't separate the effect of what they do to us. Are they just prolonging life or giving us a quality of life? They can't separate the effect of what they do, so you have to do this for them. You and you alone get to decide what kind of life you want to live. Personally, I don't want drugs and stents and tubes to prop me up just to lie around. Remember, my mom was stuck because one modern drug was used to replace a hormone that was lost in her stroke. This one modern drug kept her kidneys working but did nothing to help her get out of bed or swallow or recognize her family or communicate. Given the research provided and how you've answered the previous questions, do you want your doctor and others in your circle of care to be focused on maximizing the length of your life or the quality of your life? Please circle one. Quantity or quality? Get this straight in your head. There are many things modern medicine can do to you, but you are the decision maker. You get to decide now, while you're healthy, what kind of life you want to live. It's your choice. Now you choose. What does quality mean to you? Please turn the page to 208, and this exercise will help you answer that question. If your health care providers state you will never again regain these functions, you are to be provided care that will keep you comfortable and pain-free until you die. So, in order to live the life you desire, it is important for you to retain the ability to, and I want you to initial the statements that fit you. Do you want to be able to share your thoughts through words, gestures, or assistive devices? Do you want to be able to understand what people are saying to you? Do you want to be able to know that you're hungry, that you're able to eat and swallow if someone feeds you? Do you want to be able to chew and swallow food because losing this ability results in the need of a feeding tube? Do you want to be able to take care of your own toileting needs? Do you want to be able to take a bath or shower with or without assistance? Do you want to be able to interact in social settings? So check all the boxes that fit you. But I give you some blank lines 
and you can write more about what's important to you. List other functions that are key for you. Remember John's story? If he were filling in this page right now, he would write that he wants to be able to go fishing. Another man wrote he wants to be able to watch football on TV. And I assume that watching means he enjoys seeing and he has the ability to process if his team is winning or losing. My list includes reading and writing emails, being able to walk to my mailbox, being able to hear a joke and laugh and get it. So you see this list is key to your happiness as it's just about you and what you enjoy and what makes life worth living for you. You can even write here what a good day in your life includes. For example, each morning I want to be able to walk to my kitchen and make a fresh pot of tea or coffee. I want to be able to call my grandchildren on the phone. I want to be able to look at their Facebook pages to keep up with what they're doing. I want to be able to go to mass or synagogue or church. I want to be able to pull weeds. I want to be able to read books or listen to music. I want to be able to make myself a hot meal. So you get the idea. I wish I was sitting with you now to hear about what you're writing. Just let the ideas flow. Now, please stop the video to write. Now that you have provided clear direction about what quality means to you, you are ready to tell people, and I mean everyone. But first, I want you to choose a person and a backup that you will designate to speak for you if the time comes that you lose your ability to make medical decisions for yourself. So let's turn to page 210. Think about the people you know who would be willing to speak for you, can separate their personal desires for you from your desires for you, would take some time soon to review with you what you're writing in this document. They live close to you or can travel to you quickly or work via phone or email or text with a physician. Is young enough and healthy enough to be around in the future. Is someone you trust with your life. Can calmly manage any conflicts. Can stand up to family members who may not agree with you. Can negotiate with physicians to achieve your stated goals and be willing to fire a physician who doesn't listen. Can listen to facts presented and make a rational decision. So write your possibilities now. It could be a minister, adult children of your friends, nieces, nephews, neighbors, one of your own children, the one who's feisty, outspoken, strong, persistent, and maybe even considered obnoxious, a godchild, a cousin, a sibling, much younger one, of course, the spouse of a niece or nephew, or your own spouse, if that person is much younger, but I still don't think it's a good choice. All right. I'm going to sit with you here while you come up with some choices. In chapter four, I go into detail about the problems with proxies if you choose one who's too close to you. If you have in the past created a directive and named a proxy with all that you've learned, you will probably make another choice now and maybe not. I want you to stretch and don't just choose a spouse or child. Add as many names to this list as you can think of who might have the qualities we listed above. Please do not choose a granddaughter. Doctors say they simply are not able to make hard choices for their grandparents. Sorry, don't name all my children either. This will pit them against each other. You think it'll take pressure off the one individual child by saying all my children? This only sets up a potential fight and can drive them apart, not together. Please pause the video to make your list. Now, on page 211, write your choice and your backup. Don't quit yet. Please, go find a neighbor to come to you ASAP to witness your completing of page 213 and 214. Now, stop the video to find your witnesses. Welcome back, and welcome to the witnesses too. Now, please write the name of your first choice for proxy in the first blank on the top of page 213. Add that person's address and phone. Next, add the name of your backup or alternate proxy. Then, print your name on the line, I 
Hattie Bryant, being of sound mind, do hereby designate the above to serve as my attorney in fact for the purpose of making medical treatment decisions for me, including the withholding or withdrawal of life-sustaining procedures, nutrition, hydration. Should I be diagnosed and certified as having an irreversible condition and be comatose, incompetent, or otherwise mentally or physically unable to make such decisions for myself. On page 214, you print your name there in the middle of the page and then sign. Your friends or neighbors standing with you as witnesses then fill in the rest of the page. Please stop the video to complete this, but come back, okay? You're still not done. The way to make this powerful, the way to ensure that what you have done here is considered by all caregivers and all healthcare professionals is to make copies and give those copies to everyone you know and love. It's this broad sharing that protects you and the proxy you have chosen. If you only tell your chosen proxy what you want and you end up in the ICU, the people who know you and love you or know you and don't love you so much, they can throw a fit. They can cry and demand that you receive every single treatment and life-sustaining effort. The more people you share your ideas with, the more chance you have of getting what you want. Give copies to all your doctors, their teams, your family and friends. Even give copies to your neighbors. This is very useful as it's possible that your neighbors can be the first to find you in some kind of trauma. If they know the name of your proxy and have a way to contact that person, it could be a neighbor who has the greatest impact on how you spend the last few years or months or weeks of your life. Now, do you want to have some real fun? Grab a teenager who has a cell phone and ask the teen to videotape you telling everyone who you have chosen as your proxy for healthcare decisions. And I have your script for you. You say, my name is Mary Smith and I was born in 1950 and I currently live at Save Oak Lane. I want everyone I know to hear this from me. If there comes a time when I'm not able to make healthcare decisions for myself, I appoint Fallon Curtis to do this for me. If Fallon is not available, my alternate decision maker is Pat Gary. I want no one arguing about my decision. I want you also to know that I want to move from curative care to comfort care when I cannot do the things I have listed on page 208. I want everyone to know that I expect you to respect my wishes and that includes any physicians who are doing their best to give me care. Thank you. The teenager can now post this for you if you have a Facebook page, can send it via email to your doctors, family, friends, and neighbors, and please send it to me at hattie at I'llHaveItMyWay.com. I would love to meet you, and if you give me your permission, I will post your video at I'llHaveItMyWay.com. Mine's up there about who my proxy is, and you can go see that yourself. You can be part of a movement. Let's all do it. Let's prepare now, then get busy, and live fully all the way to the end. Thanks. <laughs>